From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. COVID-19 is back in the headlines. Hospitalizations are ticking up. An updated vaccine is now available, and the Biden administration is once again offering up free test kits. We get the COVID outlook from someone who has had a front row seat for the pandemic, former White House COVID response coordinator and dean of Brown University School of Public Health, Dr. Ashish Jha. Then... As the Jewish community celebrates the High Holy Days, leaders continue to express concern about troubling reports of anti-Semitism nationwide. Our guest on the second half of Newsmakers, President and CEO of the Jewish Alliance of Greater Rhode Island, Adam Greenman. This is becoming... Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, uh, Nisi wow. Dr. Ashish Jha. It's been a long time. You still don't learn about <laughs> Dean of the School of Public Health for Brown University. Thanks so much for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me here. So many different places we could start, but I want to start with vaccines and just really get to the basics. Yep. New vaccine. Yep. When should people get it and how effective is it against the predominant strain of COVID? Yep. Two good questions. Uh, So, yep, new vaccine reformulated for the circulating variants that are out there. By the way, this is something we do every year for the flu. It's exactly the same model. Um, All the preliminary data suggests that these vaccines are going to be very effective against the circulating variants. A couple of new variants have popped up. Early data says it's going to be effective against that as well. Will help some in protecting against infection, will really help in protecting against serious illness. Uh, this is why I think it's critical that anyone who's over 65, anyone who's ele- got a, at elevated risk of complications, absolutely needs to go out and get this vaccine. So, you know, I don't need to tell you that fewer and fewer people are willing to get a, a COVID shot. The last booster uh, had a 21% vaccination rate that I read. It's too soon to say how many will get the new shot, but would you be surprised if it cracked 50%? in the country? Look, I don't have a specific target, and we haven't when I was working at the White House. Here's the way I think about it. About 50, 60 percent of adults get the flu shot, about 50 percent. A higher proportion among the elderly. Um, The most important thing is that high-risk people get it. I I think last year, we were still in this model of, you know, a lot of people got a lot of boosters, and they were like, do I really need this extra one? This is now into a different cadence. This is now an annual shot. And I think to the extent that people can think about the fact that they get an annual flu shot, Getting an annual COVID shot just makes a lot of sense. In that framework, I am hoping we're going to see much better numbers. I, uh, I'm curious. You, you, I heard it in your first answer. You said if you're 65 or older, if you're at high risk, definitely Dr. Joss says get the shot. Yeah. I'm a reasonably healthy, if somewhat overweight, 39-year-old. <laughs> but I have a toddler and I have a grandmother in her 90s. Yeah. So someone, just me as an example, who's like, I'm not super worried about my what would happen if I got COVID, but I also don't want to put people around me at risk. How would you think about it for me as an example, people in that kind of cohort? Yeah, and I'm 52 and also a little probably a little (laughs) overweight, but but no major health conditions. Here's how I think about it. It's all about risk benefit, right? What's the risk to you? What's the benefit to you? And what's the benefit to other people around you? Here's what we know. Um, These vaccines reduce your risk of getting infected, Not, uh, not don't eliminate it, but they do reduce it for a period of time they reduce your risk of transmitting it to others. And then if you do get infected, you tend to have milder symptoms. So three good reasons why you should get it, why I will get it. And the downside is these are incredibly safe vaccines. I mean, we've done so much testing on on these vaccines. You know how much is circulating that people, I'm not saying it's scientific, but there's- There's so much junk out there, Ted. And my point on this is, look, it's hard at times to decipher what is noise, what is truth. What I always tell people is, if you're confused, talk to your doctor. Talk to uh, trusted health officials. Uh, Don't go by what you're reading online. Uh, The safety track record of these vaccines is extraordinary. And given that, given the benefits, I think everybody should get a vaccine. I think it's critical for elderly. I think it's critical for people who are at high risk. Uh, but my recommendation to my family and friends, including people who are not in that high risk category, is you're better better off. Getting so, bottom line, is everyone should get it. In, in your perfect world, we'd all get a flu shot. We'd all get a COVID shot this year. That is that would be true in my perfect world. But it is super important that the high risk people get it because for them, it's about life and death. Mm-hmm. For the rest of us, still even with these variants, for, yeah. for the high, for the older population, you know, we still have about 150 Americans dying every day of COVID right now. Almost none of them are people who are up to date on their vaccines. They tend to be elderly. They tend to be at high risk. Uh, they Maybe they got their shots two years ago and they think they're protected and they're not. So, yes, we still have hundreds of people dying uh, every day, every week. Almost every one of those deaths is preventable. Super basic question. You talked about the flu shot. You talked about the COVID shot. 
do you get them together or would you in a perfect world think, all right, get the COVID shot a little bit earlier uh, and get the flu shot later? Should you stagger them or do them at the same time? Uh, you know, I have said like, the most important thing is getting them. And so I think it's totally reasonable to get them at the same time. Last year, I got both of mine at the same time. I plan to get both of mine the same time. Did you feel really knocked year. out by getting them at the same time? No, it wasn't bad. You know, look, um, the, I got a, a one in each arm. My <laughs> arms were sore for about 24 hours. Uh, that was at least my excuse for why I, why I couldn't do any work around the house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work. Your wife might be watching. Watch out. Sorry. Um, but the bottom line was it was fine. Uh, I got out of Friday. By Saturday afternoon, evening, I was feeling totally You know, I, I don't feel well after I get the COVID shot and I've gotten the boosters. I, yep. I've had, I actually had to call out sick ones, which is rare yep. uh, for me. Yep. Um, so to hear you say that is a, a little bit surprising. I know everyone is different. Everyone's different. Some people clearly, well, some people have very significant reactions. They're really laid up for about 24, 48 hours. Um, for me, it's been thankfully very mild in terms of the side effects. The way I look at it is not great. It'd be ideal if I didn't have any side effects at all. But the alternative is if you had COVID, sure. You're definitely laid up for several days yeah. and can be pretty, and again, some people have mild COVID, but the truth is so much safer, so much better to get your immune system up to date by getting a vaccine than by getting COVID. So uh, one more detail question, then I want to zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Every time we say we're talking to Dr. Job, people have to say their COVID questions to us that we want to bring to you. One, uh, someone mentioned to me yesterday, they said, we all have old tests now yeah. in, our, in our cupboards that have been sent by the government or we bought previously. Yeah. How, do they have an expert, and I should probably know this, but do they have an expiration date on them and should we be getting new ones rather than relying on last winter's COVID tests? Yeah, so they do have an expiration date. Um, a lot of the things, look, when these, Tests were created, they were obviously new. They often had short expiration dates. FDA has gone back and retested them. A lot of them have had their expiration date extended. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the FDA website and look up the batch number of mm -hmm. your test, and it'll tell you what the expiration date really is. Um, if it's expired, uh, obviously you should not use it. Um, and getting new ones. And, and the government just announced this week, as we saw in the beginning, uh, that you can go to covidtest.gov and order four more tests per family, per household, uh, for free, and it'll end in your, uh, in your office pretty quickly. So zooming out, yeah. um, you know, we know that COVID, we know how disruptive it was during the height of the pandemic. Yep. We're now in this sort of... Uh, for most of us, I think it feels like a post-pandemic environment. Yeah. You think about it occasionally, but not as bad. Yeah. But as we get into winter, we've seen signs the numbers are going up. Yeah. Uh, you know, how disruptive do you expect COVID to be this fall and winter? Yeah. Um, certainly, I, I have no doubt you don't think it'll be like it was at the height of it. But yeah. what should we expect now in this COVID environment? Yeah. So here's how I think about this. I think we have to stop thinking about COVID alone, and you have to start thinking about respiratory viruses more generally. So every fall and winter, for years... Uh, when I, you know, when I was in the hospital, uh, I would see the hospitals filled up with flu patients, RSV patients. We've just added COVID to that now. So the three of them combined, they're going to really strain our healthcare system. They are going to cause significant problems with our healthcare system combined. So we need a strategy that looks at all the viruses together. And it says older people have to get vaccinated against all three. We have great vaccines against all three viruses. Again, I think everybody benefits from COVID and flu shots, and I think it'd be really helpful if more people got that who are not high risk. Um, and we really need to think about the long-term management. You know, people often uh, talk about where we are with COVID, and I say where we are today is probably where we'll be a year from now, where we'll be two years from now. We're out of the emergency phase, and now we're thinking about COVID as a long-term management. We absolutely can get back to our lives, do the things that are important, but we've just got to stay vigilant about making sure uh, that COVID doesn't you know, cause further burdens beyond what flu and RSV already were doing. I want to talk about your, and we can go back to, to COVID, but I, I do want to make sure we take some time to talk about your time at the White House, because yeah. I'm just genuinely curious about it. Yeah. Uh, you work for President Biden as the White House's COVID-19 respo response coordinator. A few questions here. Look, Dr. Fauci has drawn the ire of many people, particularly uh, conservatives. He's received threats. Did yes. you experience that as well? Um, look, I, there's, as you know, especially online, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of anger out there, a lot of bad information that spreads. Um, I certainly got my fair share. Nothing like what Tony Fauci has received. I mean, mm -hmm. Dr. Fauci, I think, has become a scapegoat uh, for people who are angry and frustrated and unfortunately often poisoned with bad information. Tony Fauci is a hero. I mean, Tony Fauci has done more to protect Americans than anybody else I can think of in his incredibly storied career. Um, yeah, have I faced harassment? Absolutely, both online and offline. 
Does it, is it in the same ballpark as what Tony has faced? Thankfully not. And mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that he's had to go through what he's had to. You've also been in the room with the president multiple time, times. I don't need to tell you that Biden's age has been a big topic. You know, people think he appears frail, mumbly, stumbly, may not be fit for the job anymore. What was your experience? I, I you know, I, I get that that is sort of his political opponents love sort of painting that picture. I will tell you my experience. I met with the president multiple times. I found him incredibly insightful. I found he pushed us. I would often walk in with a very clear plan of here's what I want to do. And he would find the flaw in that plan and push back on it and make me go back and do it better. Um, he was very tuned into the big issues. Um, so, I, look, my sense is most of that stuff is nonsense. It's political theater um, from a day-to-day -day policy point of view. Uh, he understood the values of the American people, and he pushed us to try to deliver better for the American people. Uh, at the end of the day, I love that in a president, and I enjoyed and loved working for him. One of the things I read uh, as you were winding down at the White House and they're figuring out kind of their next step and uh, who would be their kind of public health chief is thinking about, as you've been saying, not it's not as much about COVID anymore as, you know, public health strategies in general. What if what if there's another pandemic at some point? Yeah. You've now thought about you've thought about it for a long time, but you've now actually worked on it at the yeah. highest levels being in the White House. What are you most concerned about looking forward in terms of our ability to uh, deal with another major public health crisis based on both what you saw as an academic and now what you've seen from working at the White House? Yeah. Look, so there is a new office inside the White House called the Office of Pandemic Preparedness and Response. And this was really important to set up because there is uh, three and a half years in, like, nobody wants to hear about a pandemic. People generally are like, don't talk to me about pandemics. Um, and Hopefully I get they that. care a little because otherwise they won't be watching this movie. No, but, but <laughs> they care because they want to protect their own health, mm -hmm. and that's really important. But understandably, people are a little shell-shocked from what has been a, just an unprecedented three and a half years. Um, one of the things that we all felt very strongly about was that we have got to work on preparation. We have got to make sure our stockpiles are, are, are full. We've got to make sure that we're doing, building up real surveillance capabilities. Because just because we had one pandemic doesn't mean we won't have another one. In fact, I suspect at some point you know, in the years to come, I hope it's decades, we probably will. We want to be much, much better prepared. So I think there's a lot of attention on that inside the White House right now, uh, across the agencies, CDC, FDA. Um, that work has to continue, and I hope that they never end up using any of the stuff that they're building and, and, and working on, but the reality is Mother Nature will decide that. I want to read you a headline uh, from a Boston Globe column that ran a couple of weeks ago, I think. Uh, quote, only Sweden had the right COVID-19 response. Scandinavia's largest country avoided lockdowns and mask mandates. The result, fewer excess deaths and much less social damage. Do you agree? No, look, Sweden had a very different model than a lot of the other Scandinavian countries. If you look at a uh, number of Swedes who died, compare it to other Scandinavian countries. Actually, they had many more people who died in Sweden. Early on, right? Early on. Um, what I say about Sweden is, look, it's a, every country did this a bit differently. Um, half the households in Sweden, half the households, are single-person households. It is a very different country. And so, for instance, the ability to socially isolate is totally different than in a country where you have multi-generational households, which are much more common here. So my general view has been we have used countries as kind of a, a bludgeon to say we should have been more like Sweden. We're a different country than Sweden. And Sweden has a very, very strong social safety net. We do not. So the idea that you can take one country, 8, 10 million people, and adopt their policy a, a New Zealand had a totally different strategy. They locked things down for a year. They're an island country. So, and they had very few excess deaths in, the, in that year. My general view on this stuff is anytime you do cross-national comparisons, you want to figure out what worked there, why did it work there, how much of that can we adopt here, but how much of it won't work. We are not the same country as Sweden or New Zealand. And I think for us, the right strategy was always um, use public health measures until vaccines and treatments become available. Once vaccines and treatments become available, really rely heavily on that. And, and that's what we've tried to do. Let me ask you in a slightly different way. I have no doubt, as you've thought about this, you think some mistakes were made sure. during especially the first part of COVID. Yeah. What stands out to you as something, if, if, if you got to do it over, you would have advised people differently or, or at least wish the public health community handled something differently? Yeah, I mean, look, there's been no shortage of, of mistakes all around. One of the things I... I believe was sort of in some ways the original sin of this pandemic, and I'll explain what I mean by this, um, was 
our lack of testing and our lack of surveillance. And here's why that was, that sowed the seeds of discord that we have seen. Um, in March, April of 2020, we could see, you know, refrigerator trucks lined up at hospitals in New York City and Washington and Boston was getting slammed. And we did a nationwide lockdown because we had no idea where the virus was spreading. Virus was in big numbers here in Rhode Island, Boston, New York, Washington, D.C. There was almost none in Mississippi, almost none in Montana. And because we did not know that, we had to do a nationwide lockdown. And people in Mississippi rightly said, wait, you're doing all these public health measures. Our hospitals are empty. I don't know anybody who's got COVID. No one's getting sick. This makes no sense. And that very blunt response I actually think was the basis for a lot of people losing faith in the, in the public health response. And it makes total sense to me. If, you're, if you live in Mississippi and you see no COVID around, and yet you have public health restrictions, you think there is a problem here. So I think one of the biggest mistakes was we had no surveillance system and our testing infrastructure in the first three, four months was a disaster. You know, on, on a more public health basis, one of the things that's always hard in the, begin, in the beginning of a pandemic, you don't know much about the virus, you don't know how it spreads. Um, I think we all in public health could have done a better job of communicating with more humility about mm. what we knew and didn't know. Um, there was a desire by some people to act more certain than they were. Um, I tried to avoid that. I'm confident that I made my own mistakes. Um, but the bottom line was that we needed to bring people along and be much more humble about what we knew and didn't know. Um, you know, a lot of people very quickly dismissed the Swedish model, and Sweden initially had a lot of bad, deaths, uh, bad outcomes. But then Sweden turned it around and did a lot of things right. And we got into this thing where we just couldn't admit, like, actually, there is stuff to be learned from Sweden. Maybe not a wholesale transplant of the Swedish strategy, but there's probably lessons there that we could learn. So I, I think more humility, more learning, more openness, more communicating with the American people would have been more effective but certainly more testing and surveillance would have made a big difference. Dr. Ja, Dean of Brown University School of Public Health, thanks so much for joining us on the program. Thank you both. When we come back, Adam Greenman from the Jewish Alliance of Greater Rhode Island. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside Ted Nisi. Our guest for the second half of the program is Adam Greenman. He's the president and CEO of the Jewish Alliance of Greater Rhode Island. Adam, we're having you on because uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the high, holiday, uh, high holidays um, for Jewish people, we're in those right now. For those who are unfamiliar with them, what do they symbolize? Sure, and thank you both for having me on. Um, so Rosh Hashanah, the, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. And so our new year, Rosh Hashanah, is usually in September or October. Uh, it's uh, just like our American New Year celebration. It's festive and joyous. We eat apples and honey and sweet things. Uh, and it also starts uh, 10 days of repentance leading up to Yom Kippur, which is our Jewish Day of Atonement. It's the holiest day of our calendar uh, where we ask for forgiveness for all of our sins for the previous year and uh, pray to be inscribed in the Book of Life for the, for the year to come. And so it really is this period of joy followed by um, really solemn repentance and, uh, and looking forward. You know, it's an opportunity to look back and look forward. And I've always heard, and I, I believe this is true, that people hear a lot about Hanukkah because it's at the same, it has good, a good time slot, yeah, effectively, because it's at yeah. the same time of year as Christmas. But my understanding has always been Hanukkah is not a huge deal on the Jewish calendar. I know it's a holiday, but it's, you know, it might seem to, to a person who's not of the Jewish faith, like, oh, Hanukkah, that's a big deal. And for, this is the period that's the biggest deal. Yeah, this is, the, this is the most important part of our calendar each year. Uh, Hanukkah is, uh, like you said, I think has become a bigger holiday in, in recent history, especially because it's around Christmas time. Um, but Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, there's a couple of other holidays in the weeks to come. Uh, this month uh, is really the the most important month on the Jewish calendar. I think you said uh, told me before the program that some 20 or 21,000 Jewish people live in Rhode Island. Is yep, that correct? That's correct. Um, your organization tracks incidents of anti-Semitism. What is the trend? Yeah. So. Uh, from July 2022 to June of 2023, we saw 44 anti-Semitic incidents here in Rhode Island. And that might not sound like a lot, but uh, compared to the year previous where we had 13, it's a 250% increase. And what we're actually- And that seeing, mirrors nationally too, right? Exactly, yeah. The Anti-Defamation League tracks anti-Semitic incidents nationally. Last year, they, had 30, they tracked 3,700 incidents. 
Um, that's the most that they've ever recorded, and they've been tracking this since the 1970s. And so we're seeing the uptick that we're seeing nationally, we're seeing here in Rhode Why? Island as What's well. What's going on? So I would attribute it to a couple of things. I think the political environment that we have, this divisive political environment, is uh, certainly a cause for it. Um, but when you take that and you, and you add social media to it, um, it used to be, and there are a lot of forms of anti-Semitism, but a lot of what we're seeing in Rhode Island is white supremacist activity. And it used to be that white supremacists were really isolated. You know, they maybe had one or two or three friends. When you go online and you can find an entire community of folks who have like-minded ideas like you, suddenly you become more brazen, you feel more emboldened. And so um, the fact that uh, social media companies have really struggled to tamp down anti-Semitic, racist, homophobic uh, activity online. I think that that is uh, one of the major causes for why we're seeing such a spike over the last few years. Well, you referenced social media. Of course, a headline that caught all of our attention in the last week or so was Elon Musk, who now heads yeah. Twitter slash X, um, put this pretty wild post up suggesting that the Anti-Defamation League, which is, I don't know, is it the biggest organization advocating for for you know, pushing against anti-Semitism, is that fair to say? The, it's the oldest and the, and the uh, most prominent. It's very uh, prominent. Yeah. He suggested they are the leading, I think, proponents of anti-Semitism right. or something along those lines or anti-free speech. I mean, what was your reaction when you saw that post? I mean, I was sadly not shocked um, because it's part of a pattern that we've seen since uh, Elon Musk took over uh, Twitter or X. Um, where um, we've seen just a lot more white supremacist activity. We've seen him uh, retweet uh, prominent white supremacists, prominent anti-Semites. Uh, I've also seen so, Jewish journalists say that they it's in their replies much more oh, than absolutely. before. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it used to be the filters would tamp that stuff out or, or and folks would be blocked and banned from the site. Um, he's invited uh, folks back onto the site. And so, you know, the unfortunate thing is that um, you know, the company has a lot of challenges. And uh, when you're looking for a scapegoat, unfortunately, we know through time, uh, not just going back 80 or 90 years, but going back thousands of years, uh, unfortunately, the Jewish community tends to be this uh, scapegoat. Um, and it's one of the anti-Semitic tropes that we see. And unfortunately, Elon Musk is playing into it, um, just like others have in the past. I want to ask you a question about the incidence of anti-Semitism that's happened in Rhode Island. We, we as a news organization, have covered them. Yeah. We've covered uh, when the Kanye 2024 pamphlets have been uh, you know, left on people's driveways yeah. or DEFCON 3 on Jewish people. Um, and we cover them again as, as news events, as other news outlets do. Is, from your perspective, is it important that journalists continue to do that, yeah. or are you concerned that news coverage actually may perpetuate it? No, I actually think it's incredibly important uh, that news continue to cover it. If it's news, it means it's not normal. It means it's something that's out of the ordinary. And so what we caution folks is, you know, don't show the anti-Semitic leaflet because that's just perpetuating the, uh, that's giving face to the, the content. But make sure that you mention that an, that an incident existed. It should be news. It should be something that's reported. And um, we think, you know, all, all we're doing when we don't report it is, um, you know, it's just flying under the radar screen. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not happening. And that's something we see with our tracker as well. Um, you know, we know that there were 44 incidents last year that were reported to us. We know that there are many more incidents that have happened. Um, and so I think any time an incident uh, raises to the level where you hear about it, it is news and, and should be covered. So um, as you said, about 20,000 Rhode Islanders are Jewish, which yeah. means a million or so Rhode Islanders aren't Jewish. Right. Uh, exactly. So what, you know, there'll be people watching today who are alarmed by what they're hearing from you and want to yeah. be helpful, useful, um, good allies of the Jewish community. What would you recommend to folks who, beyond just feeling horrified at these trends, what would you say people could do? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think there's a couple of things. Um, the first is to educate yourself. I really appreciate, again, you, you both having me on to talk about these holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. I think the, the more we can demystify um, for folks and, and share with folks what we love and what we find joyous about the Jewish community and our, and our Jewish faith, uh, the, the more that folks will understand. And so uh, that piece around educating, I think, is really important. And then I would say um, be an ally. Uh, we saw a few weeks ago there was an incident with the Warwick wa uh, Water Department. Uh, mm. the, the chief of the Water yep. Department um, uh, 
uh, slapping a coworker, making an anti-Semitic joke um, that's not a joke, obviously. But um, in those moments, standing up and saying this is not okay, that goes such a long way to supporting the folks in the Jewish community, supporting the, not just the victim, but the entire community, knowing that people stand with us and creating those opportunities. Uh, Adam, unfortunately, we have only about 30 seconds left, but yeah. with incidents of anti-Semitism, have you been satisfied with the law enforcement response? Absolutely. Uh, law enforcement has been a terrific partner to the Jewish community. Um, this uh, uh, On Monday, when uh, folks are at Yom Kippur services, I know that there will be law enforcement officers at every single synagogue, because unfortunately, that's a reality for us. Mm. Anytime there's an incident, uh, they're on the phone with us, working with our community security director to make sure that the Jewish community is safe and sound. Adam Greenman, President and CEO of the Jewish Alliance of Greater Rhode Island, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you both very much. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching. If you miss any of it's on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week.